Welcome back to another episode of Consciously Clueless. I'm your host, Carly, and I'll be your guide on this journey from consciousness to cluelessness and back around again. Today on the podcast, I talk to Jake Conroy. Jake has been an activist since 1995, organizing and participating in successful local, regional, national, and international pressure campaigns. He helped build the foundation of the grassroots campaign Shack USA and was arrested by the U.S. government for his role. Dubbed the Shack 7, Jake and his co-defendants were found guilty and he was sentenced to four years in federal prison. Currently, Jake hosts the podcast Radicals and Revolutionaries and can be found online as the Cranky Vegan, where he helps reimagine the tactics, strategies, and optics of the grassroots animal rights campaign. Here we go. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. Is there something interfering with your happiness or is preventing you from achieving your goals? By now, you all know that therapy is an important part of my own self-care. It has truly been a game changer in every aspect of my life, including achieving goals. BetterHelp is the largest online therapy platform worldwide. They are changing the way people get help with facing life's challenges by providing convenient, discreet, and affordable access to a licensed therapist. BetterHelp makes professional therapy available anytime, anywhere, through a computer, tablet, or smartphone. You can start communicating within 48 hours. It's not a crisis line. It's not self-help. It is professional therapy done securely online. And I have a special offer for Consciously Clueless listeners. Visit betterhelp.com slash Carly and join the over 1 million people taking charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. By using this code, you get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp.com slash C-A-R-L-Y. Take care of yourself today. Thanks again to BetterHelp for sponsoring this podcast. All right. Well, thank you for joining me on the podcast today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Really excited. Um, So the podcast is called Consciously Clueless, and that came from this place of me being like, cool. I love learning about all these things. I'm with it. I get it. I'm like, I have arrived. And then other days where you're like, just kidding. I know nothing. Uh, and all of that. So I like by asking, I like starting asking guests, like, where are you at just in this moment today from clueless to consciousness, whatever that means to you, how are you feeling? Uh, I feel like I'm generally leaning towards the clueless side, um, Mm -hmm. in life. Uh, but that's kind of the fun of it, I think is trying to figure stuff out, you know, and becoming bigger and better and person and building better communities and stuff. Maybe this is getting a little deep for a first question. Oh, that's perfect. I I really like, um, yeah, I think, you know, I do a YouTube channel and a majority of the YouTube channel is me putting out opinions and ideas and thoughts to the people that watch it and then having conversations about them. And so they come out on Thursdays. And so today is a day that I put a video out and it always builds up conversation and people always bring up ideas and like oh maybe you didn't think about this or maybe you could have thought about this differently and then um so it does kind of move me more into that clueless area yeah but at the same time I like it there because I'm, I'm learning which I think in, is a, in a very awesome. welcomed way yeah 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 I like that what about you where where are you where are you at are you, are you being on the clueless or the Ooh, Good question. You're like the only, like the second guest <laughs> ever switched the script on me. Um, let's see today. I am feeling like really comfortably in the middle. Like I'm starting some new projects and I'm like seeing some growth happen. So I feel like I'm like making these, um, goals that I've set myself for myself for a while. So that feels like I'm kind of with it. Um, but it also means I'm starting all these new things that I've never done before. Yeah. And so I'm learning a lot, uh, and a little c- clueless in a welcomed way. Nice. Yeah. Thank you for asking. You're welcome. So you are the cranky vegan. I am. Yeah. Uh, let's, let's first talk about that name and where that came from, um, because that's what you are on all your platforms. <laughs> and it's yeah. like, it's, I feel like it's your shtick. You're too far in. There's no going back. No, yeah. I realized that a little, a little late <laughs> in the game. <laughs> so tell me about it. Where did that come from? Um, I, I think, I don't know. I think it's just, I just been like, like I question a lot of things. Um, and, and I tend to feel cranky about a lot of things. So I just made, and I'm vegan. So it just kind of, kind of made itself up, I guess. Um, 
No, I think it goes back to a little bit of that, of that like clueless thing where it's like, I'm constantly asking and questioning. Maybe mm-hmm. it's just the skeptic in me and being an animal rights activist, you hear a lot of things about right. the movement's at and how the community is at, like where the community's at and how things are changing it. And I, I think I just kept asking myself, really, are you sure it's changing that way? Cause it doesn't feel that mm. way. Like, are we saying these things to make ourselves feel better about what we're doing? And if we are, then is that really helping? And so, right. um, you know, I just, it led to a lot of questions that there weren't really any answers to. And I think, um, um, I've always said I'm good at complaining, which probably isn't my best trait, but, but, uh, yeah, I think that led to just me. Being, yeah. It's just, I'm just cranky about things. So. Uh, so how long has that cranky vegan title been around? Officially, probably, God, I don't know, maybe four years or so. I think I started a okay. YouTube channel maybe four in like 2018, I think. I can't quite remember. But the crankiness has been with me forever. It's just me. <laughs> <laughs> Using it for marketing purposes is four years. but yeah, exactly. You got to roll with it. And now I'm kind of like pigeonholed in this thing. People are like, that video today was not very cranky. I'm like, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm and you're like, like, it's, it's the name. <laughs> I don't want to be a jerk that like all the time, you know, I got to have a little, a little fun, a little happiness here and there. So you mentioned being an animal rights activist. Um, how long have you been an activist in that world and how did you get there? Um, it, I got involved and interested in activism in like 1995. Um, I um, had moved to the Pacific Northwest um in the united states when i was 18 and that was just kind of like a hotbed of activism and radical activism um and i could, i think i've always always had that idea of like right and wrong and, and you know you know just making that decision between what's right and what's easy uh, i think that's like a thing that my mom had instilled in me since i was a young kid um and so i wanted i think as i became an adult quote unquote <laughs> i was like uh, I, you know I, I, I should probably i don't know i felt compelled to like act on those those feelings of of injustice and having the ability and the privilege to be able to try and do something about it and so i got involved in a lot of different forms of activism um uh, i got interested in animal rights um i became vegan um in like 1995 um and but knew that that just wasn't going to be enough for me like like a lifestyle change wasn't, wasn't what was going to change the world. I didn't think. And Mm -hmm. so I wanted to be more involved in activism. And so I just kind of searched that out. I know that this is not the point of that story, but I'm imagining the difference in vegan products in 1995 to now. And, uh, what a world. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I actually just was talking about this. It was a lot of like silken tofu in a box. That's, that's disgusting. Uh, rice, <laughs> rice milk, which I, I can't stand. And like, yeah. I have a bad sweet tooth. So I ate a lot of like rice dream Neapolitan ice cream, which is, uh, which basically literally tastes like sand and sugar mixed together. So yeah. it's a real treat, a real treat. Yeah. My, uh, my best friend growing up was vegan when we were in like middle school, elementary. And I remember being like, the idea seemed good. And she would talk to me about things and I'd be like, yeah. And then, you know, even that was 20 years ago now. And she was like the, the silken tofu, the rice yeah. milk. And I remember being like, this is not the journey for me. Mm-mm. I can't commit <laughs> at this, uh-huh. at this level, at this entry point. Yeah. It, it was it um, was a disgusting time, but if you don't know yeah. any better, <laughs> disgusting like... <laughs> time, <laughs> dark days. It was dark. It was dark. But if you don't know any better, or you don't know, not that you don't know any better, but the but you don't know like what's to come, then right. um, it makes it that much more exciting. I remember yes. going on as a, as a middle schooler. I didn't have that perspective, yeah, yeah, yeah. but yes, <laughs> I remember going on tour with my friends, you know, band in like 1996 or 1997 and going driving around the country for two months. And like, my goal was to find a vegan milkshake. Like I was like, God, I gotta have a, I gotta have a vegan milkshake. I miss them. And I think I only had one the entire. I was going to say, did you find any? Actually, I think I remember finding two. Yeah. And that was it. What did I bet you were just pumped? I was like, what a, what a find. <laughs> yeah. I remember where they were. One was in Syracuse, New York. 
Um, and I believe it was at a place. This is so memorable, 97. (laughs) Yeah, I think it was at this restaurant. I want to say it was Stronghearts, but I don't know if Stronghearts Cafe was around. It might've been, Um, but they had like 20 different like vegan milkshakes. And then, which in that place, Stronghearts is still around. And then there's another place in Phoenix, Arizona that made the Soinami, which was like the equivalent of like a Dairy Queen blizzard where it's like a mix and type of thing. And I was like, why can't we do this everywhere? And that place is still around too. You can still get the Soinami in, in, in um, Phoenix. So there you Not go. sponsored, but check both of those places out. Really? <laughs> OG, Arizona uh, and New York. Asking. Yeah. Good times. So, so when you were talking about like you're being an activist and you were noticing, are things really getting done? You're asking these questions. What do you mean by that? Can you say a little bit more about kind of just being like, are we saying this to help us feel better? Like, what what are you talking about? Yeah, I, I I think I think at an early activist age for me, like pretty early on, I realized you know I'd been doing a lot of different things, protests, civil disobedience, uh, disruptions, but a lot of educational outreach and talking to people, um, and it felt good, like it felt like I was doing a lot, but it, but it wasn't until I started doing what's called like pressure campaigns that I really started to feel like things like I was making a tangible difference. And the idea of pressure campaigns is you kind of pick a target or an issue or an industry or whatever it is. And you use a lot of different strategy or use a lot of different tactics. Um, like every tool in your toolbox to go after them, um, to pressure them to do what you want them to do. Maybe that's the policy change. Maybe that's changing of a practice. Maybe that's just shutting, shutting that place down altogether. And so we started doing pressure campaigns against places um, that sold fur in the greater Seattle area. Mm -hmm. Um, And we were getting those places to stop selling fur and and shutter their fur salons. Uh, We moved on to, or I moved on to uh, with some friends starting an organization to stop um, a hunt um, by, you know, doing more direct action tactics, like placing yourself between the hunter and the hunted. Um, and we did that for a couple of years and we were successful at what we were doing. And then I moved on to helping start an organization called stop hunting to animal cruelty or shack, which was like a pressure campaign that was in 18 different countries. And we were in the U S chapter shack USA. Wow. Yeah. And it was a very grassroots, you know, no nonsense pressure campaign to shut down one of the world's largest animal testing laboratories. And that was also a, a really exciting and successful campaign. We didn't shut the lab down, but we did achieve an awful lot. Um, and part of that, or because of that campaign, there was a handful of us that went to prison. And so there's six of us. That was my next question. (laughs) Six of us in the United States went to prison, um, and for several years. And when I got out, the animal rights movement was completely different. For Uh, several years. Yeah. Um, if you don't want to talk about that, you don't have to, but I feel like that's a real gloss over of going to prison for a couple of years for animal <laughs> rights activism. No, no, I'm happy to talk about it. Um, I, I, I didn't know if I'll finish the, the, the first question. Yes. And jump yes. Back. We'll, we'll put a pin in it. We'll jump back. For sure. Uh, so I think when I got out, the movement and what, what the animal rights movement was doing was completely different. There were no more pressure campaigns, really. It was a lot of swing, swinging back to like, educational outreach like oh we just talk to enough people we'll be able to change enough people and when we change enough people we'll be able to, we, we will be able to shift the largest industries in the world to do what we want and we will win <clears throat> and that didn't make any sense to me and i would go and listen to these speeches and talks at these conferences by these like movement figures and and leaders and they all would say the same thing right a tipping point right a tipping point for animal rights for animal liberation if we can just get this, you know, push just a little bit harder, we'll win. And I just kept thinking, really? Are we really going to, like, are we right. winning? Um, and, and, and that way. are we a at a tipping question. point? Yeah, right. <laughs> a tipping, a tipping point for what? Yeah. <clears throat> and so that's why I started my YouTube channel, partially because I just had these conversations with myself thinking, how, how, are, how is anyone believing this? So I started a YouTube channel. I called it, are we winning? Um, mm-hmm. Um, and did that for about a year or so, and then realized no one was watching it because it had horrible branding and no one knew what it was about. So I changed it. To, I was like, apparently the only way you can get animal rights people to listen to you is if you call yourself a vegan. So I changed it to the cranky vegan and then, True. and then it changed a little. Um, so that's uh, kind of the, the 25 years in, in a, in a nutshell. Yeah. 
Okay, so we put a pin in an important <laughs> part yeah. of this. So what, if you can share or want to share the action that led to that arrest and then like what that experience was like and- Totally. That's I mean, holy, holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> it's a huge conversation and it's an important one yeah. and it's interesting. Um, I obviously won't be able to get into all the details just for totally. time, time issues. Um, but there is a documentary that came out a, a couple of years ago that's executive produced by Joaquin Phoenix called The Animal People. And it's a documentary about our organization and the um, the trial that came um, came out of it. And then, our, you know, about spoiler alert we were all arrested and put in prison <laughs> but there's the end of the movie you're welcome um, <laughs> oh, so, shit. so uh but if you want to if you want to take a, a deeper dive into it, that's like an hour and a half documentary that i think is a really good one and it's important it's got a good, good it's got a lot of lessons in there that i think so literally about this incident about this or about this moment yeah yeah so oh, wow. we started this campaign well it started in england to shut down this laboratory trying to figure out how to condense it as best as possible but basically <laughs> there were people in england that felt the same way that i did when i was living in seattle they were sick of just kind of doing the same thing over and over again they wanted to pick a place and shut it down so they, they started going after these places that bred animals for vivisection for animal experimentation and they're shutting these places down one after another it was exciting but it wasn't putting a big enough dent into the um into the industry can i interrupt for a timeline here where yep. we at in yeah, that was 19. They started the first campaign in 1996. Um, right, okay. And learning about that campaign in 1996 is what got me interested in starting to start those pressure campaigns against those got first it. So they do that till about 2000 or till the year 2000. And they win a whole bunch. They shut all these places down. And they decide to take all the things that they learned um, and perfected and apply it to a bigger target, which was a lab called Huntington Life Sciences or HLS. And they're the one, they're like the third largest contract research organization in the world. So they test products for other companies on animals. They're like a third party testing. So they test, they tested things like um, food coloring, uh, oven cleaners, Splenda, Viagra, all that stuff was tested there. Jesus. And so they killed 500 animals a day, 180,000 a year, something like that, 72,000 animals in cages. And they set out to shut them down. And within a year, they almost did it. So they moved everything to the United States to kind of shelter themselves. And that's why we started uh, SHAC. Um, we started the US chapter. So we were SHAC USA. And we started learning a lot from the UK and what they did. Um, and how they did their research. And we looked into these corporations and figured out what made them tick, right? We figured out who was responsible for the decisions being made um, and how we could pressure them. Mm -hmm. I think the cool thing about pressure campaigns is that you can use secondary and tertiary targeting. The idea that like a corporation needs a whole bunch of different corporations to make them exist. And you can pressure those secondary corporations to drop your target as a customer, wow. uh, but the customer can't really do much about it. So, so like we protested against their banks, anyone that gave them a bank account or financing, we protested those banks. Um, we protested their insurance company because a company legally needs insurance to exist. We protested their auditor because they need an auditor. We protested their internet company, the people that put food in the cafeteria and toilet wow. paper. In the like anyone and everyone could be a target. And if you take away an insurance company and take away a company's insurance, they can't legally operate. Right. And if you make a big deal about it, no other insurance company is going to be like, I don't want to take on this company and be protested next. And so they wouldn't. And so we financially crippled this corporation. You know, we got over a hundred of the largest corporations of their kind to like stop supporting this laboratory. Um, and we also went after their, their share price. We, we went after, their shareholders, their stockholders. Um, we went after the companies that traded the stock. Um, and we got, we were so successful that we got um, this company removed from the New York Stock Exchange. Wow. And then we got them removed from the over the counter bulletin boards, OTCBB, which is like the next step down from the New York Stock Exchange. And then they went on to the pink sheets, which is basically penny shares. So at the beginning of the campaign, this company was trading for about $30 a share. And at the height of the campaign, they are trading for about two or three cents a share, two or three pennies. Like we just guess. Yeah. Um, and that was very satisfying, right? For on a personal level, but also 
you know, we ran this campaign in a way that was very non-hierarchical. Um, there wasn't, we didn't believe that like there should be leaders telling everyone what they should and shouldn't do. Um, we basically said, if you want to protest against this laboratory, do it, like take responsibility for your own actions and your own organizations and your own communities and do it. And right. we can all work together. Even if we disagreed, which we did often, you know, we still supported one another. And that meant people could participate and take ownership over their own activism um, without people telling them what they had to do. It also meant that people could participate in any ways that they wanted. We weren't going to dictate what tactic they could use. We would, we would be uh, against the use of physical violence in any form. Um, but beyond that, we would not like necessarily condemn or condone anything. So people wrote letters, they signed petitions, they sent emails, they did protests, they did disruptions, they did civil disobedience, they did illegal underground active activism, like smashing windows, uh, spray painting buildings, breaking into laboratories and rescuing animals. All of these things were happening all around the country. And it was also happening in 18 countries around the world, wow. all pressuring operation, and it destroyed them. Um, and I think it got to a point, and I'm getting to the, the point of my story. I am here part. for it. No, keep going. <laughs> I'm like, yes, okay. And then? And so <clears throat> at a certain point, the pharmaceutical industry, which is very powerful and a huge lobbyist in the United States, went to the government and they did the same thing in England where you know the, the head of you know the campaign was. And they basically said, you need to take these people out. Otherwise we're moving you know, our trillion dollar industry out of your countries. Um, and so the FBI and also in the UK started an investigation into the campaign and they spent years um, wiretapping our phones. They recorded like 555 90 minute cassette tapes for the phone calls that we were making um, from our home, which was also our office. Like the three or four of us lived together in a home and ran this campaign. Um, they followed us sometimes 24 hours a day. They were monitoring our internet use. They were. Um, Did you know all this at the time that this was happening? I mean, not officially, but like you'd be a fool not to think it was happening. Right. 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 Um, they were going through our garbage. They're paying the garbage man to keep our garbage separate. That's so what I was wondering. Through. I was like, were you starting to know this just because you're like, well, obviously they're get, they're going to do something. Or was it because there were signs that you were seeing, like someone's following me or like someone's digging yeah. through our fucking garbage. Yeah. I think, you know, when, like I said, like, you know, coming up in the, the animal rights movement at a radical time in the mid nineties, it kind of prepares you for that. Like you are told, or I was told anyways, from like an early activist age, like the government and these corporations will, are out to get you. Don't right. trust them. You're being watched more than likely. They're listening to you. They're following you. Don't trust anything, yeah. <laughs> which is a tough way to live. Yeah. But yeah. Helped out when we were doing this campaign, you know, um, yeah, so the garbage man was being told to keep the, the garbage separate, the post, the our PO box, like they were collecting all of our mail and photocopying the envelopes and stuff before they would give it to us, all sorts of things. It was the largest FBI investigation of the time, like five times more than the second largest investigation. And they said that our group, along with two other organizations, were the biggest uh, threat to the security of the, the United States. Um, and oh so the, my goodness. I, yeah. I mean, okay. Yeah. There's obviously so many things going through my head and I'm sure you are think you've thought all of the same. So I'm just going to let you keep going, but holy, <laughs> holy, like, holy shit. That's annoying. <laughs> like, yeah. And so, um, and those other two groups were, they were underground illegal organizations, but they were the ALF, which is an animal rights group. Uh, and, and the ELF, which is an environmental organization as well. Um, they're a clandestine and, you know, non-hierarchical and mm -hmm. things like that. But, um, and so in 2003, they raided our office and our home and took a bunch of stuff, took everything uh, to try to shut down the, the uh, campaign and start an investigation. And then in 2004, they came again, six o'clock in the morning and body armor and guns drawn and, and came in and arrested us as well as a handful of people around the country. Um, and then they, um, charged with charged us with a variety of crimes out of the state of New Jersey. So um, our the lead prosecutor who was charging us was Chris Christie. People follow along with US politics. He ran for president a few years ago against Trump. He's a real piece of work. So he oh but he was the God. he was the attorney general for the state of New Jersey and was 
the one who was, you know, signing, doing, spearheading this. That feels right, yeah. though. You know, that feels yeah, right. Yeah, it's, on, it's on mark. Yeah, yeah it's, on, it's on brand. <laughs> yeah. This podcast is sponsored by TerraSeed. TerraSeed is on a mission to disrupt the vitamin industry, empower vegans, and reduce plastic waste in the world. They put everything plant-based people struggle to get in an all-inclusive, vegan, compostable package multivitamin that replenishes them and our planet every single day. Seriously, y'all, win, win, win. Even if you're not vegan, this vitamin will help you get those key nutrients that you need. I am so excited to share a discount code for your first purchase. Use code CARLY50 at checkout to get 50% off. Again, that's C-A-R-L-Y-5-0 for 50% off your first purchase at TerraSeed.com. Don't forget this code so they know I sent you. This podcast is supported by Who Gives a Crap. Who Gives a Crap is an eco-friendly toilet paper company that donates 50% of its profits to help ensure everyone has access to clean water and a toilet within our lifetime. Who Gives a Crap has donated almost 8 million U.S. dollars to nonprofit organizations who help provide clean water and toilets all over the world. Who Gives a Crap is delivered straight to your door with carbon neutral delivery. I love that it comes that way. I don't have to think about it. It's an automatic subscription, and I want you to try it. You can check out Who Gives a Crap and get $10 off your first order over $54 with the code CARLY10. That's C-A-R-L-Y-10, or check out the link in the show notes. So um, they they charged us with a variety of crimes. There are six people, and by the you know, come the time that we decided to take it to trial, there are six of us. They charged us with a variety of crimes depending on how they deemed, you know, who was the quote unquote leaders of non-hierarchical movement, which doesn't really make any sense, but you know, non non-hierarchical organization organizing doesn't make sense to I was just gonna say our government does not understand non-hierarchical. No, No. like someone has to be in charge. So um there was myself, uh Lauren and Kevin, we were charged with six six offenses. Uh Josh was charged with two and Andy and Darius were charged with one. And the one count that we all shared was the Animal Enterprise Protection Act, which is this law that was written in the 80s and 90s to, <clears throat> excuse me, to try to stop people um, from driving around the country and breaking into fur farms and laboratories, releasing animals and smashing equipment, which was what was happening back then. And so the law stated that if you cross the state line to disrupt a business that uses animals and you did more than $10,000 worth of physical damage, they could essentially try you as a domestic terrorist. That's so in so our case, specific. Yeah. And, you know, these people that were doing this stuff were already engaging in illegal activity. They're breaking into laboratories. Like, they, they don't really care. I was going to say, law, yeah, I was going to say, like, I feel like of all the things to do, another law they'd be breaking is like, who gives a shit? We yeah, just broke yeah. into your lab. <laughs> right. And smashed like a million dollars worth of equipment, like, or, yeah. or lit it on fire. Um, but yeah. But anyways, and so for us, they said that we crossed state lines uh, using the internet because internet organizing was very new at the time. We were, you know, we were kind of spearheading this, this idea um, that we crossed state lines using the internet um, to disrupt the business that used animals, which is the lab. And we did more than $10,000 with the economic sabotage because, or damage because we affected their share price. Um, <clears throat> and we thought- well, Feels like a fun thing. interpretation of the law. <laughs> yeah. It was a little, a little, it was sketchy at best, but it's Chris Christie. Like, what do you expect? And so, um, you know, long story short, like we fought it. We took it to trial, even though the federal government has like a 95% success rate. Um, we felt like we had a first amendment right to assemble, right. to um, report, which is what we were doing on our webpage by reporting on legal and illegal activities. Um, we had um, freedom of association. We could be friends and associate with other activists. Something that they said was a, us joining a conspiracy to engage in, you know, essentially domestic terrorism. <clears throat> um, we took it to trial. We had a mistrial. We started the trial over several months later, um, and then we were uh, found guilty and sentenced to a variety of prison sentences. And what and so year myself, was that in terms of sentencing? That was, well, we were found guilty in February or March of 2006, and then we were sentenced in um, 
September of 2006 okay. and then reported to prison in December of 2006. Okay. Um, and I got 48 months in federal prison. So I did um, in, in the feds, you do 85% of your time. You can get 15% off good time, quote unquote, good time. Um, so I did 37 months in two prisons in Southern California. I did six months in a federal halfway house in Oakland, California. And then I did three years of probation um, after that. And that ended in May of 2013. And that's the whole story. <laughs> <laughs> See you later. <laughs> Just cuts to black, signs uh-huh. off. That's it. Never hear from him again. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. So, wow. Yeah. Uh, thanks for sharing that. I know that you've probably shared it a zillion times, um, but that Not is, I think an incredible perspective of the animal rights movement that I haven't had much of on this podcast. I'm really glad to be speaking to you because that is, like you said, a really radical time. So what you're describing seems like a much different time in the animal rights movement than like what I've witnessed in the last few years in getting involved, you know, let's say starting to even have this on my radar truly in the last five years. Yeah. And that, yeah, it's definitely that feels wildly different. So for you, you have this experience, you go to prison for it, which again, Jesus. Um, and then you're like, okay, so I get out, the movement is different. So let's talk mm-hmm. about that point. You get out and you're like, all right, where, what were you thinking at that moment? Were you like hanging up that hat? I mean, obviously you didn't, but were you like, that was a bummer. <laughs> Or were you like, how am I going to make this better or different? And how was it? What was the landscape like? I mean, it was a lot of things. Um, For me, like everyone's experience in prison is different. I was in a place where the first place I was in for 25 months was pretty like rough and extreme. There's a lot of like violence and fights and beatings and stabbings and race riots and all sorts of stuff. Um, and that was, that's takes a toll on, on someone. I don't care who you are. And so totally. for me, like getting out of prison was like, okay, how do I, how do I mean, like recover from and like, like reintegrate, deal. not even that, but just like, how do I deal with PTSD? Right. You know, like, yeah. like I, I'm depressed. Um, um, yeah. I live, yeah. I've lived this prison life for years and now it's completely different. And I, and, and I was only in prison for, you know, three and a half years or whatever. I can't imagine what it's like for people that do decades of time, but you come out and like the world is different. Yeah. Like not just like literally, but like the way that you view it is different and the way you interact with it and, and in it is different. Um, and that that's, that's heavy. And for me, you know, in terms of animal rights, it was like, I think a lot of, you know, when we were doing the Shack campaign, most, almost all of the large organizations that you know today hated us because we were taking attention away from what they were doing. And we were, we were kind of the big thing and yeah. we were taking their support and we were taking their money and they didn't like us. They tried to get us banned from conferences, things like that. Um, <clears throat> and so, and on top of that, I think there was a lot of people that saw us go to prison and they got scared, which is totally reasonable and fair. Like, I don't want to go to prison, nor do I want anyone to go to prison. So I think like people are like, all right, we need to shift away from doing this type of activism. And which so, is probably think- what the government wanted, right? It became this like sh- this showing of like, see what happens when you try. For sure. And I think that if you watch the movie there, it goes into a little bit deeper, but the government had been working on this for decades on how to cut the head off of the animal rights movement, the radical part of it anyways, um, and get rid of it. And I think this was a kind of a culmination of it along with what was called Operation Backfire, which was the equivalent of what they did to us, but they did it in the environment, the radical environmental space as well. And seven or nine people, I think, went to prison there or something like that. Um, <clears throat> and so, you know, I think that opened up an opportunity in the animal rights movement for people that wanted to return to that gentler form of like, hey, let's just talk to people and change the world with hearts and minds type of thing um, to flourish. And it did. Um, and it's just not what I was interested in. And I don't, I'm still not interested in. And so uh, it was depressing to be like, God, like the animal rights movement no longer has any bite. It's a shell mm. of what you It's advocating for things that I think aren't even animal rights issues. They're welfare issues. Like 
oh, chicken should have an inch bigger cage to die in, you know, stuff like that, where I'm like, I'm just not interested in that. It's right. not what I want. Right. Um, right. But I couldn't return to doing the things I was doing before because I would get myself in trouble. And so for me, I got, and this is where I started getting involved in other movements more, you know, you know investing more time in them. Um, so environmental movement, climate justice movement, um, you know, to a certain extent, like where it was appropriate being involved with the Black Lives Matter movement um, and, and political prisoners and things like that, supporting political prisoners. Um, and that was really helpful because I think it allowed me to like see how other movements were doing it yeah, uh, and learning from other communities that I wasn't involved in in the past and being like, oh, they're doing pressure campaigns. They're doing them successfully. They're not all going to prison for it. Right. That's a plus. Like, how can I bring that message back to the animal rights movement? And so, you know, I started doing lectures, uh, you know, and talking about these issues around the world, talking about my prison time, the shack campaign, the lessons learned, both good and bad, and the idea of what pressure campaigning is and what it could be. Um, and that's what led me to start the YouTube channel too, particularly as like, you know, COVID became a thing and we're all stuck in our homes. It's like, well, I might as well just talk about it on, on YouTube for a while. Literally, <laughs> that's literally why I have this podcast. I was uh-huh. like, well, here we are. <laughs> like, yeah. I should start a yeah. podcast. What else have I got to do? Yeah. And so, uh, yeah. So, you know, I started doing YouTube channel and um, working on other projects and trying to learn new skills. And, but what I have seen over the last several years is a return to pressure campaigning. Um, that was my next question. Yeah, I think it's exciting. Like, I, I think like history is is cyclical, right? Like it goes in circles. And it, it, like, I knew that pressure campaigning was eventually going to come back. I knew that like, you could see it. Like what started out after Shaq is like a very soft form of, of outreach and education kind of turned into a little more aggressive forms of outreach. You get things like- Because things aren't moving right. quick enough. Yeah, people get frustrated. And so you you see things like, or people like Gary Yarofsky or Anonymous for the Voiceless, or these kind of more aggressive forms of outreach, um, which I still think it is garbage. I don't think it works. And I think, in fact, it hurts. Um, and then you see, um, and I think, I think as you start to see people realize, God, like I've been aggressively advocating veganism for three years and like nothing's changing. In fact, right. it's getting worse. Right. And then people start realizing, okay, let's go after these corporations. So my idea, my thought, whether it worked or not, I don't know, but was to use my, my platform and my YouTube channel, all that stuff to kind of speed that circle up. Yeah. Like, let's move. I, I can tell you what's going to happen in five years time. Cause it's already happened. And yeah. so like, let's just get on with it already. Cause it's going to be better and you're going to be happier and we're going to see more successes. And I think like, whether it happened on a normal timeline or not, it, like we have returned to um, pressure campaigns. Um, but I think we can be smarter about them and be more strategic about them. Um, but I think that is what's happening. I'll pause so, in case you have any questions or I could just keep rambling totally. You. No, no, no. So, well, I'm wondering like, what is that looking like in 2022? So pressure campaigns. I'm also wondering for people that are listening that are like, okay, I, I'm becoming more interested in learning mm-hmm. about this like activism, but not trying to go to prison tomorrow. So like, what does that look like for people now? And if people are like, what can I do? Yeah. What do you tell people that are like, okay, I'm, yeah, I see you. I hear you. I get it. Now what? Right. Shaq was like a very radical example of pressure campaigns. It's not a usual pressure campaign. And, and I talk about it because it's my experience and that's what I know Mm -hmm. about. Um, My heart is in radical politics because I think that's where interesting and good change comes from, but it's not for 99% of the people that want to do activism. I I recognize that, but pressure campaigns look like a lot of different things. You know, there are pressure campaigns I'm not really excited about, but like changing those cage sizes that we talked about earlier, that's a pressure campaign. Like that's pressuring corporations to use cage free eggs or free range chickens and things like that. Not stuff I'm interested in, but those are pressure campaigns. Um, You see it in the environmental movement a lot, like pressure campaigns being used against climate climate change, um, against um, it's interesting to be, cause I work in the climate climate movement now as a, as my day job. And it's interesting to see the oh. pressure campaigns evolve because they are like the last several years or decade, they've been going after banks. And it's like, Oh, we did that with Shaq. And, and, and now we're seeing it with these larger, org- not that they're 
correlated, but it's just interesting to see right. the natural progression. Right. But like going after banks to be like, you need to stop funding mountaintop removal. You need to stop funding tar sands uh, extraction. Um, and now just in the last couple of years, they've switched to insurance companies, which again is something that we had done, you know, a decade earlier and seeing the successes there of like, you need to stop insuring mountaintop removal of tar sands extraction. And you start picking all these pieces away at the foundation of these main targets by going after that secondary and tertiary targeting, which I think I love. It's my favorite part about campaigning. Um, but the other thing that I love about pressure campaigning is that you use all the strategic tools in the toolbox. I look at it as like a puzzle, right? So you look at the puzzle is, is like the, the overall picture, right? That you're trying to make. The strategy is how you put those pieces together to make that picture. And the tactics that we use are each individual piece. So you can't show up with one piece and expect to put the puzzle together. Like you have to bring them all. And so that means you use all sorts of different tactics. You use letter writing, you use petitions, you use outreach and education, you use protests, you use disruption, civil disobedience, whatever works to get your point across and to pressure these companies and individuals, you use them. And so there's great ways to, to um, bring people on board that want right. to involve pressure campaigns. Are you great at fundraising? Raise the money for groups that you like or causes right. that you like. Are you great at design? Design some leaflets or a web page. You know, are you great at organizing protests? People always need to organize protests. Like there's always ways for you to, to, to punch in. And I think like, if you really enjoy just talking about vegan outreach, that's also part of like um, pressure campaigns. Like when we would educate people about the laboratory as Shaq, we would do a table, hand out okay. literature about why we're trying to shut down the company, shut down this laboratory. But also if you care about this dog or the cat that's in the cage, maybe you should also, you know, consider the cow or, or, or the pig or the chicken or the mink or the elephant that's also in cages. And they start putting those things together. So you're doing both at the same time, um, which I think is, is a cool thing about campaigning. Well, that's what I was going to suggest as well, is that I think we often, and we like big, we uh, get stuck in this very, you know, um, binary thinking with a mm -hmm. lot of things in life. So it's like, you either have to do this um, really radical progressive mm -hmm. campaign or it's just like milk toast or you know right. like finding totally. how there's all those and I've experienced that because I tend to be more um outspoken or more kind of like ready to to say stuff not always great stuff that's part of the problem <laughs> uh yeah. but um and I for a while was like well if if you're not saying as many things and like showing up as much as I am like you're not doing it right uh -huh. um, like I totally was in that position I own that yeah. like I totally was there and seeing the different entry points into like where people can make a difference is really important for sure yeah I agree I was a total asshole for a long time yeah that angry vegan phase <laughs> that be angry vegan it's phase real. for me was rough <laughs> Yeah, why well, too? I look back at it and just cringe. But I mean, we all go through it, whatever. But mm -hmm. I think, you know, um, I think that was something that I combated like the first year or two of my YouTube channel pretty heavily was like, I basically took all the groups that were really popular in the grassroots animal rights movement and be like, great, they exist, but here's the problems with them, in my opinion, and how I think we could do things better. And no one like that. Which is fair. Like no one yeah. wants to be criticized. But yeah. fair enough. Someone's gotta do it. <laughs> but but the response would always be like, if we don't do this, do you want us to go and I'll go to prison and, and do a pressure campaign? It's like, no, there's a, there's there's like some this and give and like take. this yeah. plus right. Yeah. Like you like doing outreach. We need outreach and pressure campaigns. You like doing disruptions. We need this. Like you have all the tools that you're available at your fingertips and you're good at them. Like anonymous for the voiceless is good at doing outreach with their TVs, direct action everywhere. They're great at doing disruptions. Um, the save movement. They're great at doing visuals, but you're not accomplishing anything because you're all just kind of buckshot running around doing all these different things against the circus and the fur and vegan and this and that. Like, why don't we all come together and work on one thing and use all of our tactics and our puzzle pieces to build something cool. And people were very angry at that <laughs> idea. Angry at the cranky <laughs> vegan, which is a, yeah. fun, a fun thing. So it was you, a great time for sure. you, <laughs> super fun. Uh, yeah. You mentioned about specifically before anonymous for the voiceless and about how maybe that is hurtful. Uh -huh. So like, could you say a little bit about how maybe those campaigns are actually detrimental to the movement? 
I, I don't think that I don't think that anonymous for the voiceless in itself, the idea of educating people uh, and using TV screens to do it is a hurtful thing. I think it's I think it's something that's been used for, you know, at least in the United States, maybe 27 years. I don't think people realize that. Like, I think people think it started with anonymous for the voiceless or Earthlings experience. My problem is with the leadership of anonymous for the voiceless, which is uh, it comes from like a marketing background um they're interested in making money they're interested yeah. in right-wing politics um they're interested in literally changing what veganism the definition of veganism is um to suit their own kind of movement and cause and to me that's really dangerous like i'm all for coming up with new ideas and tactics and strategies i think that's super important but at the same time like but like what's the goal I think it's shifting away a movement or trying to shift away a movement from what its core values are. Right. Is really dangerous. Um, and so when you start talking about like, you know, you come out with like kind of these like jokes about trans people, or you say that like prisoners should be experimented on instead of animals and, and you need to be aggressively, you know, going after people. And, um, and then somehow that's going to change their heart and mind these things are, I think are detrimental. They're not just like things I disagree with. They're things that I think are ultimately dangerous to the, the survival of the animal rights movement. Um, and I think we've seen people shift away from the organization, continue to use the same tactics, which I think is important, but just like kind of straight, like realize that like, like we can't succeed by, you know, you, liberation has never come from the right. You know what I mean? Like, you can't grow liberation for all right. from people that have right-wing politics. It just doesn't work that way. Right. Um, and I think people slowly start to realize that. Again, I'm not saying that anonymous for the voiceless is a bad thing. I'm not saying anyone that does anonymous for the voiceless are bad people or that they're necessarily wasting their time. I'm just saying that I have a problem specifically with the leadership and how they're running things and, and what they're kind of espousing that I think was really a, a dangerous thing. Um, but yeah. That makes total sense. Yeah. Um, are there any kind of like pressure campaigns in terms of the vegan movement right now that are gaining a lot of traction or that you're excited about or anything that you like can share that is on your radar that might not be on the radar of our listeners? Yeah, I think in the United States, well, around the world, really, there's people doing campaigns against the fur industry in really big ways from passing laws and getting bans. Uh, of fur farming in their countries, passing uh, bans of like sale of fur in their countries or their cities, their states. In the United States, that's been happening too. And then the, in the last like, you know, less than a year, you know, this small grassroots group of people have kind of come forward in kind of the same kind of vein as Shaq um, and been like, let's do this non hierarchical um, structure of of protests against the fur industry. And there's the group, the coalition to abolish the fur trade, which is an organization that's been around since the nineties, but in its current iteration, um, you know, has kind of formulated the strategy of starting out small and kind of ramping up excitement and victories and momentum, which I think is smart. Mm -hmm. And then being able to move on to bigger and bigger um, challenges. And they've knocked these places down one after another, after another. And I think it's, it's exciting to watch. Um, and watch it take off. And so that's a good one. I think I really like the campaign against um, um, MBR Acres, which is a place in England that breeds dogs for laboratories. They actually used to um, sell dogs to Huntington Life Sciences, the laboratory we, we were protesting against. Um, and there's a campaign to shut that place down and it's, it's going well. And again, it's it's all different types of tactics and ideas and philosophy. Some people are like, Hey, we need to be very gentle and do this. And some people are like, no, we need to be doing secondary targeting and, and, and everything in between. And it's working. Like it's, right. it's cool. It's been a really rallying point. And it really harkens back to those original breeder campaigns in the nineties. And even before that in the eighties that were so successful. And so it's cool to get to see that start up again. Um, you know, and there's, there's all sorts of really like, interesting groups around the world, small grassroots groups that are doing really cool things, you know, Animal Rights Alliance in, in um, Sweden, um, uh, Direct Animal Action in New Zealand, um, Animal Justice Project in England, 
all these organizations that kind of started off very small and have grown and expanded, but still maintain that grassroots energy yeah. um, and those pressure campaigns and combine it with like outreach and doing veg fests and things like that. I think it, they're really cool and inspirational. They're like a good way to see like what it looks like to do grassroots activism, but not all, like take away that vegan outreach. It's combining those two in really like effective ways is is pretty cool to see. I know I'm missing a whole bunch of ones, but those are the ones that just popped off the top of my head. I expect you to list them all, but um, (laughs) I am curious because I think a lot of our conversation has been, um, which is amazing, has been really big picture, right? Has been like systematic. Um, Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, like what, just genuinely curious what your approach is if like you're one-on-one with someone and they're like, tell me why I should go vegan. Like what's your elevator speech? Can you come from this like, radical political background whereas I would probably be like a little bit more of like a basic vegan girl like telling Uh, you about veganism (laughs) like I'm curious like what your kind of elevator pitch is uh people hate my elevator pitch cool Um, good to know that's a great start (laughs) it's a really good start (laughs) because ultimately I don't care if people are vegan it doesn't matter to me like it matters like I don't want people to eat animals in terms of its effectiveness and stopping animal cruelty today it doesn't really do anything I think it's a personal lifestyle change I don't you know if if someone on an elevator goes vegan they're not going to be like uh, we got one more vegan and someone's at the slaughterhouse, like taking three animals off the slaughter line. Like, all right, go back to the sanctuary. Have a good life, buddy. Like, that's right. just not how it works. Right. Like we do not have the ability to um, create enough vegans to affect demand. We just don't. It's like four people are born every second. Two people die every second on this planet. So that means there's two new people every second of every minute of every hour being born on this planet. And um, they all eat animals. I mean, 99.9% of them. Um, and how do you keep up with that? How can you possibly transform enough people right. to become vegan to make, to even compete with that or come close? You can't, right. you just can't. Um, and I don't mean that to be a downer, what I, but what that means to me is like, I'm less interested in people who are ve- becoming vegan and more interested in people becoming activists. Mm-hmm. Like I would much yeah. rather have someone out on the street protesting against that laboratory um, who's vegetarian or an omnivore than someone that's sitting at home doing nothing and eating beyond burgers all day. Like, I think the person in the street is doing more for animals. And I also think if pressure campaigning is done, right. Like we talked about earlier, they get that, they get that, like that introduction to veganism. I look at pressure campaigns. Yeah. Someone, someone, someone explained it to me as like a spear and which was a terrible idea because I think it kind of references hunting. But like, if you're like jabbing a spear in to something, not not an animal, but that tip of the spear that like first, I always say it's like a going to the doctor and getting a shot that wasn't tested on animals. But the, that first kind of prick of the needle is that is that pressure campaign. It kind of introduces the needle, and the rest of that like injection is everything else. Like it's it's all right. you know the, the rest of the issues. You can get people interested in animal issues because they care about dogs. They care about cats. They care about elephants. They care about horses, whales, dolphins. Um, so run campaigns that, that are for those animals. You're going to get loads of people involved that aren't vegan, but then you right. get to have that opportunity to have that discussion. You know, that dolphin in the aquarium is the same thing as, you know, when we were doing the whale, trying to stop whale hunts, it was like talking to people that were vegan, that were opposed to the whale hunting and being like, a gray whale is a bottom feeder. Like they're just like the cows of the ocean. Like they're the same thing as the cow that just walks around the field and eats grass all day. And I'm like, God, I never really thought about it that way. So you get both, right? right. And so I'd, I'd rather get a twofer uh, by creating an activist uh, who will go vegan as opposed to talking to someone about veganism that I just don't have the ability to change. That's interesting because it kind of speaks to, and maybe, maybe this isn't where you're going, but at least where my head went, just activism in general. So it's like, mm-hmm. do you want someone to believe Black Lives Matter? Like, yeah, I fucking hope so. Or do you want mm-hmm. them to be like actively then doing something for the movement? So I guess it's, it is right. that like a fair comparison just in terms of like belief versus doing something about it. Yeah, for sure. I think we, I think we love to talk about what we believe and who we are. And we like to debate ad nauseum, particularly on social media about our beliefs and how you're wrong and I'm right. And it doesn't change anything. Everyone right. likes that it changes everything, but it doesn't. 
But if we get all those people out on the street or whatever, writing letters, signing petitions, raising money, designing web pages, like if we all put that energy of argument into activism, our, our movement and our communities and our victories would grow exponentially, I think. And again, I'm not saying I don't want people to be vegan. I definitely do. Right. I just think exerting that much energy to plant those seeds that might sprout in a week or a month or a year, or 10 years from now, you know, might, might, might just is never a, yes, it will. It's just a guessing game. Right. And we can look at the numbers of vegans, the percentage of vegans in our, in our populations, and they don't change that much. They may be gone up a uh, half a percent or a percent, maybe 2% in the last 10, 20 years. Um, but you can look at the number of animals that are killed every year. And that is going through the roof over right. and over and over again. So what are we doing? Like, do we want to feel good by convincing our friend or neighbor or someone on the street to go vegan? Or do we want to do the hard work to shut down the industries that are not only killing these animals, but they are running hugely successful propaganda machines to convince everyone that we need to eat and consume animal products and animals. Like, I don't know. To me, it's an obvious answer. Yeah. Well, that I feel is like a really good place to end for now. And I would love to say for now, because that triggered about mm, 75 more questions. <laughs> so hopefully we can connect again. Uh, for sure. This was a really great conversation. Where can people follow you, get a hold of you, check out um, all your crankiness? Yeah, I got a lot of places. All oh, it's the cranky vegan pretty much. Uh, Instagram is probably where I spend majority of my time as the cranky vegan, Facebook, Twitter, um, my YouTube channel is the cranky vegan. I just started I'll a put podcast. all that in the show notes too. Got it. I just started a podcast called radicals and revolutionaries. Well, we are that. Yeah. Interviewing people that like started out doing radical animal activism back in the sixties and seventies. And like, what amazing stories that these people have. So, um, that's worth checking out. I think, um, yeah, I, I didn't know that you had started that until I was doing some more research today, just cause you know, you want to yeah. know what's going on when you talk to sure. somebody. And I was like, save. <laughs> that looks uh -huh. really cool. I'm really excited uh, to dive hey. in. Yeah. The stories are just incredible. Like to, to hear about someone doing a protest for battery against battery cages in 1961. You're like, Jesus Christ. Like, that's amazing. That's like, incredible. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and I also do a Patreon, um, where all the money raised, we donate hundred percent of that money to, um, grassroots projects and sanctuaries. And this month we're going to give away about $6,700. Um, That's and it's incredible. cool. Incredible. I saw that today. Yeah. I'm going to join. Yeah. And it's cool. You can join us a little as two bucks when you, when you join, like you get to nominate places you want to be put up for a vote. And then we all vote as to where the money goes. I don't have a say in any of it. Like we, we all work together and pool our money together, just two bucks. And we're giving away like, you know, last month we sent $6,700 to a sanctuary in Ukraine, in Ukraine. Um, we oh, wow. sent money to sanctuaries i think in four different continents um we've given away i think over forty thousand dollars in the last year and a half so it's cool i'm proud of it that's really incredible thank you for doing that work i'm excited yeah. to join i have a patreon but i selfishly keep the money but i uh, <laughs> i will on you. i know i know i know i'm a real asshole um but i will be joining that patreon as well I'm, i want to be a part of that community cool thanks Thanks for listening to another episode of Consciously Clueless. If you enjoyed this episode, hit subscribe wherever you're listening. If that's somewhere like Apple Podcasts, leave a review and you could be read on air as the review of the week. Looking for more podcast content, yoga videos, meditations, and all around amazing community? Head over to patreon.com slash consciously carly and check out what's going on. And finally, if you are ready to make changes in your life, but don't really know where to begin, let's work together. Head over to consciouslycarly.com and we can start the process and get you happy. Until next time.